Hi, how are you? Oh, hello, hello. Hi. Um, how is everybody? I'm feeling chaotic today. I don't know about you. It's been a very busy afternoon, and I'm definitely going to chaotically eat my gyoza while we have this chat, if that's okay. It's an yeah. alternative to political panels. Gyoza has to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> I love that for you. Um, okay, Brent, you're back. I think our, t our, our audience probably has seen Anusha a couple times now, but um, you are uh, a First Nations chief in Serpent River. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? We're so pumped to have you back here and um, to see your, your delightful face. Amazing. Well, it's great to be back, Sam. Thank you for having me on. Um, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Chief Brent Bazayo. I can actually do my formal name. So, Ani Bojo, Noden and Nini Indishnikaz, Makwa Dodem, Mayang and Dodem, Gunabajing and Don Japa, and Cheese and a Big Zibing and Don Da. So, hello, everybody. My name is Chief Brent Bazayo. Um, I am part of the Wolf Clan, and I my community is Serpent River First Nation here in Northern Ontario uh, on the North Channel. I am also the chairperson for Memo West Wing, the North Shore Tribal Council, and also I was recently named the Huron Superior Catholic School Board trustee. I know, we'll, we'll talk about that later, won't we? Okay. <laughs> very busy lately, but um, I'm very excited to be here and uh, share my thoughts on some of the Indigenous issues with this campaign and also uh, listen to questions and other things. So, quite exciting. Woo. Well, it's to have you here. That's amazing. Um, okay, so what's going on with the election? It, it has been a day since we last talked about it, um, but it feels like so much is going on. I think I read something about mandate letters, very confused about what's going on with that. Um, I feel like two of the party leaders have COVID, which, like, Chaotic. like, like spoiler alert, the pandemic's still going on, in case, like, any of us were... Um, Monkey pox, like... <laughs> Okay, we, we agreed not to talk about that, though, right? We said we were not going to talk about the monkeypox because we're not ready to process that information yet. I don't think emotionally any of us can handle talking about monkeypox right now, so we're just going to put that under the card. was not on the bingo card this year. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that wasn't. No. Um, yeah. Okay, so maybe um, maybe we could do what stories have we been keeping our eyes on. Maybe, Brent, is there something that you've been paying a, t a lot of attention to? And then we can get into sort of like all of the platforms and their t take on Indigenous issues and or life. Um, but yeah. Um, I really honestly that I've been the last few days, the election is, hasn't really come up on my radar, partly because it's very lackluster with the things that I, I need in my life and, the, you know, things that affect my community. Um, and I mean, we can go through the, uh, the platforms later, but I think some of the biggest things has just been um, the lack of oomph. I feel has been in this campaign. There's no excitement. There's no, I, I, you know, it's not exciting. It's not thrilling. There's nothing that makes me want to, um, well, I'd go and vote or the, get really excited about party platforms. It's kind of just like, we're, I don't really know. Yeah. Just blah. I think that that's blah. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that deeply. I think our, our content team yesterday night, we're talking about like, what, like, how does everyone feel genuinely about the election? And like, there's a lot of anxiety around Ford winning again, um, but not like, it's like a, like it's a blah and it's like stress and it's just like not, nothing is what we need it to be for change to actually like transformational change to occur in the province. Um, so then you're, you're forced to like pick between a bunch of like, all, all, like, not like good but not great not what we exactly need like maybe like a b option or like a b plus option but not like top marks well b i think b is even friendly at this point like <laughs> being generous yeah it's being generous um, well i'm so curious because right in your leadership capacity you would have i imagine have worked very closely with the foreign government or at least interacted with them right what was that experience like, i'm so curious working with because you're likely going to have another four years of it we all are so if that's the case what was your experience what are you expecting um so working with government is always interesting as a first nations leader because um it de really depends on the minister depends on the de then the department and then get really technical and boring but the departments are separate i see because i have some really good relationships with like deputy ministers and the adms and the bureaucrats yeah um, and then i have some um fluctuating relationships with the ministers, I would say. So there's some, you know, if you Google, there's probably some 
me calling out a few ministers for lack of responding. And um, again, I always chalk it up to uh, treaty relationships and not many people understanding, you know, the, my role and what, who I am as a chief and what that means. And um, we know we see a lot of the parties in Ontario being we have nation to nation relationship. But I'm like, that's actually not true because it's nation to province relationship because you're provinces and you're not in the provinces aren't nations. So um, well, I'd love to hear you actually explain more about that if you don't mind. Like, I, I, that's really interesting to me. And I don't intersect, intersect with this a lot in my day to day. So I'm curious. Okay. So nation to nation relationships, uh, the treaties basically state that Indigenous people, we cre created treaties um, with the Crown. And then in Canada, back in the 70s under Pierre Trudeau, inherited essentially the responsibility for, for, for the Indians, I guess. Um, and that's so when we talk about nation to nation, Indigenous people, we still hold that we are independent nations. Um, I've been elected as chief. I, I, I am the leader of my, my nation. Um, and my, my, my level that I'm supposed to be working at is with the queen or another head of state, right? That's, that, that's, how, we, that's how we kind of view it. But in reality, I work mostly with the ministers and, and, their, and or their technicians. So it's an, always a challenge to try and explain to new ministers um, some people get it. We always have um, other ones, you know, they're really receptive to Indigenous needs and things like that. But it's always a challenging relationship because not only do I do deal with local local community issues, I'm dealing with regional issues, like provincial issues. And then I'm also at the federal level. So I, I operate through all three levels of government and I work with all three levels of government. Um, and so I meet with the mayors of the small towns that are next to me. I meet with the premiers. Um, I meet with also with the, the federal, my federal counterparts and the federal government. And so... That's that's always fun because you get to meet really cool people, but it's also challenging because I'm only one person, <laughs> and um, you know you get you get kind of talked around a lot with um, some of the departments. I never thought that was a question. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, and then so with the Ford government, um, it's been good. I mean, uh, Serpent River just got 12 new um, long-term care beds or 16 long-term care beds. So um, that that was a great collaboration with the local hospital, and that was awarded right before the election, um, and so. You know, that was a big announcement. So we're happy there. Um, but again, something that I, I really want to impress upon people is that whenever I'm dealing with with provinces or I'm dealing with 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 government, they tend to view us a lot through economical means. Like we want to support Indigenous people because, you know, economy and, and, and this and getting them back. But there's so much more. Um, and I kind of want people to move beyond just seeing Indigenous people as something as a resource or to be included in resource extraction because, you know, I need... I need my laws to be enforced. I, I need, there are things that I need that the, the provincial governments or federal governments aren't recognizing because, you know, they can't recognize my, my bylaws or the things or the, the things I make, right? Or um, enforcing our own laws. So that's always a challenge. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm working a lot to be, no, you need to recognize my lawmaking authority, recognize my governance. Um, and that's the challenge of being within the Indian Act, being within all of these all of these wonderful things. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you about how that kind of plays out at the provincial level because I was so curious. I'm like, that's that's just so interesting to hear. And it's, oh my God, that's not an easy task. <laughs> no, and like uh, First Nations are federal responsibilities, right? But in Ontario specifically, we actually have downloaded a lot of the responsibility to the provinces um, through various uh, social agreements and all of these different things. And so um, it's challenging sometimes because they'll be like, oh, go and talk with the provincials. Like, no, no, but federal like um so very adaptive in our relationships i would say mm -hmm. you know i really the sense that sorry i i would relate to this in the sense that um i i um the canadian government also has historically very much treated immigrants as economic opportunities right when we needed more people because we were an aging population when we needed to keep an economy filled and growing suddenly the government is far more amenable to having an open immigration policy so it's, it very much is, like, I completely see what you're saying, where historically marginalized people are, you know, to however many different degrees, are brought into the fold often when we make the economic case or it's made for us, that we're, we're, we're labor to be extracted or resources to be extracted or, you know, that's what we stand for. But just, like, do you, and, and Sam, I know you had a question, but my, my question for, for you, I'm so excited to talk to Brenda at this time. Um, my question for you, Brent, is like, where do you see the future of that going, knowing that you have four more years of Doug, potentially, I know nothing's set in stone, but, you know, having four more years of Doug Ford ahead of you, where do you see that work going? 
Um, I, to be honest, I don't see, there's no difference to me between the parties. It, and, and that's a really funny thing to say. So there's no, like, no matter who is in charge of the colonial project, whoever, no matter who's in who has the levers, um, yeah. you know, it's just minor differences, the policies, the, the, the implementation, what the, the, the overall goal is still the same. Um, some are just nicer than others. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I say that there's a really great people that work, um, really great people that work in the government but then there's also you know historical discrimination systemic issues like and we know that the government is is a giant giant beast that doesn't turn as quickly as it needs to and i think that's kind of some of the issues that we're having in, in the modern modern times that um stuff is changing so rapidly in society and the governments are not able to adapt as quickly as we need and it's just I don't, yeah. I think that's weird because I, I, I agree with what you're, the sentiment of what you're saying, but I think it's like, it's intentional, right? Like, we know they can move fast when they need to. It's just that they choose not to around other issues. Like, um, 215 children were recovered in Kamloops, BC, and they had three, like, uh, calls to action done in like a hot second. It was like, if those were that easy to do, why weren't they the first ones you knocked out? Yeah. Well, what uh, so they were pretty performative, weren't they? They they were. They were they were super performative. But like the point being, like, why did you wait until like some exactly. tragedy, like the news cycle, like oh. it just like if you could do it, you you would get it done. You just have chosen not to. Yep. Um, and I think that's where there's I I feel that with younger people when I talk to folks, there's just like this. What is the point? Like we understand the function of government, but like why are we subscribing to this back in the day when we like format of slow politics and like dial up styled work when we're in like a high speed society now where things are changing and we need to be able to take care of everyone who lives within these like colonizer made borders. Um, so it just, I don't know. It just like, I like have a lot of faith in the people Um but I get really frustrated with the system. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the system used to be different, right? Like the provincial, the government's actually built things. So we don't actually, when's the last time? And, and I will say Canadians are super passive. We don't demand anything from the governments. Like, like what is the last major thing that would we demand? Like, what is it? When's, we built a canal system, we built railways, which were really bad, but you know, we, we this, this country used to build um, giant, uh, you know, well, obviously, because they need to colonize things, but like national projects that used to bring everybody together. And we haven't actually done like, no, we don't build anything. If we just placate business, it's it, we're in the business of business instead of governing and building social programs and actually recognizing that government shouldn't be run like a business because it's about providing goods and services that necessarily might not, you might can't save money. You're, it feels lives, right? Like we... <laughs> But we're we're stuck in businessifying, businessifying government. And yes, first past the post is trash. I love Heather Smart. I like that Heather Smart's amazing. Um, so Brett, why don't you take us through the platforms from your perspective? And I know you're saying that like there really is no difference, and I hear you. But obviously, like I got to vote. So. All right. Okay. So let let's go through some indigenous some indigenous platforms. Okay. So we'll start off with the current government, progressive conservatives. Hello. So their big thing is critical mining resources, of course, because we got to unlock Northern Ontario for all of its mineral wealth. Uh, the Ring of Fire, which is <laughs> severely opposed by many First Nations communities in the north. Um, I think they're promising $1 billion to build a road through communities that don't have road access right now, which is really great, but not to connect the communities to get right. to the minerals. Um, so... Again, many much of the Ford pot, Ford actually hasn't released a platform. I think it's just the pre budget. It's just the budget. It's, it's just the budget. So it tracks, I'm going, though. I wouldn't release a platform if I got elected the last time with that one. Like I, that, this tracks to me. Fair enough. Um, and then that's pretty much what all it is. And then random mentions of training dollars and development dollars, which is what every party promises First Nations people. Oh, we'll give you training. We'll give you development. It's all great because we need you to go into the jobs in the mining and the resource sector so that you have permission. We have permission to do the mining and resource because you're involved in it. Um, something that is a little concerning though that the Ford government did say is that they want to add more policing to unregulated tobacco. 
um, which is essentially First Nations tobacco industries, um, which is outside of the provincial control because it's a indigenous right to have and operate and run our own tobacco industries. And so um, anytime you hear about gray market cigarettes, they're talking about indigenous people. <laughs> like it, it, that's, that, that's what they're talking about is, is gray market cigarettes is indigenous people's livelihoods like there's you know all of that so that's pretty much what the Ford government is looking is to unlock the potential of northern Ontario um, and that's kind of I'm from northern Ontario and we continuously kind of get left behind in some of the conversations with the south I mean Toronto is the city every all leads road to Toronto um, and it's kind of all the policy is developed from that mindset and that's that's a frustrating part too is that um, northern Ontario we're kind of different um, that, I mean, and what works in the cities will not work up here. Like I have to travel an hour and a half to get to the next nearest city, right? Like a lot of services are spread out over hours. Um, mm -hmm. And when you develop policy, when your, your mind is people who live in downtown Toronto, it's hard to get them to understand the lived realities of people outside of Toronto, outside of even Southern Ontario. Um, yeah. And so it's really interesting when I see a lot of parties talk about, we need to unlock the North so we can feed the South because that's a lot of the mentality that we get up here is basically like, okay, so Northern Ontario is only useful to feed Southern Ontario resources, which is all of our timber, mining, um, we're the energy producers. So we are the, the, the engine of the economy and it's all about extracting the wealth from Northern Ontario down south. So that's kind of, I'll, let, I'll, I'll pause because people <laughs> like you don't ask a question. <laughs> that it's such a good observation and it's also i mean from my experience so my background is in political organizing and i work in government relations and public affairs day to day right and so when running campaigns i'm always like i hear things like this i'm thinking okay what's the tactic what's the tactic what's the tactic and as you must know the tactic there is that the dense voter bases are in the urban areas and so yes doug ford ends up winning because he gets more numerically more ridings in the north or whatever that amounts to the support he needs to win. At the end of the day, the densest areas of voters are in the urban writings. And so when you have this battleground happening right now in this current election, we see the progressives are battling it out to see who's going to win opposition. And so it makes sense to me that not just, you know, the PCs, but other parties as well are focused on that northern extraction bit because they need to compel the, the south where they're actually fighting to win because the NDP and liberals are not going to win up north. The NDP and liberals are going to win where in the urban areas. So it makes like it's 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 the north for the south for the north thing because they're it's it's this constant contradiction of like if you focus in too much on one community, despite that every community deserves you know equal attention, equal support from their government because it's supposed to be that your government supports everybody. When you're actually targeting in and focusing on one, you're doing it to the exclusion of others. When you're pushing out communications. So this creates a lot of challenges, like logistically it creates a lot of challenges. Because How do you get a message out that says, okay, we're gonna represent you and prioritize you and you alone, but then do that without making the other folks that are actually gonna get you in power peeved that you're doing that in the first place. So it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a really frustrating game because it's like you're trying to push this massive ball up a hill like on the, on the actual, like in, in Andrea Horvath's war room, right? Like in, in in these partisan settings, you're trying to push this boulder up this hill, and it's way too fucking big. And it, it's and it's literally it's like the the livelihood and well being of this province that you are trying to push up this hill. So it's very frustrating, is what all I'm all I mean to say. But I it just I hear you. It makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense what you're saying. It's 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 wild. So then we'll go we'll go over to the liberals because I think they're yeah. next. Like I have it, I have it written here. So I'm like liberals are next. So they want to do teaching about residential schools, which is which is great. Um, actually, Serpent River, so my community has the largest residential school, well, at one point was the largest residential schools in Canada. So currently, I'm also the, um, one of the caretaker communities on what's known as the Nisonag Partnership. And we are investigating the Spanish residential schools, which had over 1500 kids at one point. So um, we're working on that right now. So it's another project that that's ongoing. Um, and so it's nice to see that the liberals want to be teaching about residential school everybody everybody's into residential school right now so that's really good um they want to invest in first nations libraries which is really interesting because first nations libraries are really important um and funding indigenous institutes high-speed broadband and legislating the holiday for the truth and national reconciliation day which i'm on the fence about like i'd rather just everyone else work because it's it should be a holiday for all of you it's a, our holiday or, but it's not even a holiday for us it's more <laughs> of a commemoration so it's it's so it's a conflicting thing um yeah. they it want also to invest in healthcare that Sorry? Done it, right? It's a performative thing in and of itself too, right? Like I'm not going to be opposed, but I'm also not going to credit it with being a substantive policy that's going to do something. You know what I mean? 
yeah, I'd rather have four day work weeks than and like, <laughs> an hour day. like let's, let's... And also that's also part of that OLP platform, no? Like they're putting the pilot out, no? We'll see. We'll see. I, I've been trying to push that here in my region because it, it's important. Anyway, we'll, we'll keep going. So investing in healthcare, ending boil water advisories, which are, is a hot topic everywhere. Um, fun fact, my community does have a water treatment plant. However, the membranes are $100,000 and they come from Poland. So, you know, there's a war going on in Poland right now. <laughs> so these are, the, these are the things that I have to deal with. It's like the international, <laughs> like I got to find new membranes for my things. Yeah. Um, also, we've got, they want to build 22,000 homes for offers or members, which is actually really kind of interesting. However, I am going through a housing crisis right now on reserve. Um, I think everybody's going through some form of housing slash living crisis right now in Canada. And so it's nice to see 20,000 homes for offers or members. However, I hope that any party is seriously engaged in nonprofit like let's develop, we need affordable housing markets. Um, and especially on reserve, uh, we, our housing standards are just, yeah, we need to work on a lot of that. So that's happening and appointing a minister of reconciliation, which I, I had to sit and I had to really think of like, is this a good thing or is this like a bad thing? Because for me, reconciliation should be a part of everyone's job. It shouldn't just, as soon as you make it one person's job, everybody instantly just stops caring because well, it's so-and-so's job. Like that's, mm -hmm. it's, no, no, it, it needs to be ingrained into like every, and I, I, yeah, so I'm on the fence. We'll, we'll figure that one out as it goes. Cause I'd like to, it's very vague, right? Like what is, what's the minister gonna yeah. do? Are they listening to grievances? Are they implementing cuddly feely? Are, you know, true reconciliation is giving the land back. <laughs> like just honor the treaties, give us land back, right? Like put it like, um, and so, yeah, but however, uh, Stephen Del Duca still wants to unlock Northern Ontario's metals and mining reserves and focus on energy projects and strength and revenue sharing agreements to help prepare Indigenous people for extreme weather. I mean, that that's funny. Well, that's, um, but... That is funny. <laughs> that's like, we've destroyed the planet, but let me set you up for success. Extreme no, but weather's coming. Governments are doing, hey? Like, that's literally it. That's it. So, I mean... <laughs> Coming up being across G7 anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And then he also wants to ensure that we're long-term benefactors of extractive industry, which again, I, I, how do, I don't know how to get it across to parties that it's great that you want us to be partners in industry, but that's like, there's so much more to indigenous relationships than just being industry partners. Yeah. And that's the frustrating part where it's always just reduced to, we'll help you get into the industry. We'll help you do extraction. We'll help you. Well, no, I, I want my language. I want my culture. I want you to restore my governance. I want you to, you know, I, I out of the 3000 some people that are between a few communities here, only five, five of us can speak the language, right? Like these are the things that I'm, I'm, I'm looking for. Not so much, you know, Oh, we'll help you get into mining and things like that. Um, yeah. It's, Someone, someone in the chat is saying access to polling stations. Oh, we have polling stations on reserve. We Great. set them up. Is that consistent the across right. all? Um, no. <laughs> it's supposed to be, no? Isn't that like, is it, like literally like mandatory? Like it's supposed to be the case that there are. That's awful. Yeah, no, I think there was some issues in Northern Ontario this year at the federal election. So a couple mm -hmm. of the fly-in communities just were either didn't get polling stations at all or um, there was just a lot of a lot of kerfuffle, I think. <laughs> so hopefully this year it's fixed, but yeah, we'll definitely be having a polling station on reserve. Uh, actually, oh, okay. we're gonna be having a candidates night, I believe sometime soon. We're inviting all the local candidates to come. So that's exciting. Get to grill them directly. That's good. All right, take it to the NDP. Okay, um, implementing UNDRIP, um, implementing the calls to And what is that for anyone? UNDRIP, oh yeah, sorry. UNDRIP is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Which is um, like the United Nations, which Canada is a part of, has come up with something and we have not implemented that as a thing that we... Kind I'm of? Sure at the federal level... They... The, but like all of our provinces have not subscribed to this. But it's international... And correct if I'm wrong here, Bram, but th this confuses me right off the bat just because I appreciate the spirit, but it seems like a symbolic gesture because the province, like you said at the very beginning of this conversation, is not a state. And don't you have to be a state in order to adopt an international treaty? technically and canada hasn't adopted it they've they've acknowledged it and then they yeah. want to like tweak it to make it fit oh, canadian course. law because you know they say it's i don't even know um but again um a lot of what's within undrip which is all of this extraction the, all of the industry right like all of these the, the mining all of this stuff if you were to implement undrip 
that would radically change all of these platforms because indigenous people will be able to say, no, like we don't want to build a mine in our backyard, go build that somewhere else. Right? Like, no, you, you we're going to say, no, um, we don't, you don't have our consent to do this. And under UNDRIP, the governments have to respect that. And that, that is just a whole different ball game that they don't want to do. Um, so there we are. And so, yeah, you can, NDP can implement UNDRIP, but again, I think what the BC John Horgan in, implemented UNDRIP and we know how good he's respecting indigenous people out west. <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> right? it's like so, hilarious and, and depressing at the same time. Like, I don't know how to process. Well, it's it, again, I don't, I, I have no idea how to process it because P, you, we, all we can do at the end of the day as indigenous people is hope that you live up to your promises and it's like, I, I, I'm running out of hope because every time we get promised something, it inevitably has changed or it doesn't come up to like what it's the fully meant to be. Um, and then again, they have transforming the justice system, um, implementing the calls of, for justice for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report, um, reducing incarceration, implementing a suicide strategy, cleaning up grassy narrows. So the NDP have a little bit more, there's a bit more words, they add in treaty, they add in right, but again, it's very vague. How are you gonna do this? How is this going? And, and what are the effects? You implement UNDRIP, great. How are you going to then engage Indigenous people meaningfully? What does that look like, right? And so a lot of these things when it comes to Indigenous people, there's a lot of vague, like fluffy promises, but it's like, I want to know why, I want to know how, and I want to know when you're going to ask me to get involved so that we're active partners in this. Mm. Um, and then the Green Party, same as all the other parties, pretty much, um, skills, healthcare, housing, implementing UNDRIP, uh, respecting the treaties and remediating grassy narrows. Um, yeah, I will say, so my community, although we do not have the same environmental and long-term effects that grassy narrows has, um, Serpent River is home, was home at one point to what's known as the Cutler Acid Site. Um, this was a sulfuric acid plant that the federal government built in the center of our community. Um, and they operated for five years and it dissolved all the uranium that was um, mined out of well, basically where we used to live. And then in the 60s, 67, they blew it up and it spread sulfuric contaminant all across the First Nation and deep into the water table. And so we're still, after 30, 40 years, we're still going through the process of trying to get them to help us clean this very beautiful space in the center, the only flat land in the community, pretty much. Um, and these, again, there's a lot of long-standing environmental issues on reserves that have caused by extractive industry and people don't realize that indigenous communities indigenous lands are the easiest place to build extractive industry because the government can just appropriate it and it's good you'll never see it you, and most canadians will never experience it but it's integral to the industries that run this country and indigenous people are consistently used as um just that's we're just used so that's 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 the frustrating part so yes, out of all those policies, I mean, I, 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 I'm not inspired by any of them. I, I really want, I don't even know what I want at this point in terms of some of these, because it's like, I'm just tired of being used as like an economic unit. I'm tired of being seen as a partner only in industry, um, you know, or somebody that only needs to be spoken to if, if they want my permission to come and mine my lands, right? Like it's, there has to be something else. There needs to be a new, new something. So I think that's like where Canadians come in, which is like the weird part, right? Because we're in this whole era of like understanding and, and coming forward and, and young Canadians especially need to, to, to figure out how can we move forward with reconciliation in a meaningful way that's not just mouth service and endless platitudes and promises, mm -hmm. like meaningfully engage us in these processes. So well, yeah, that's... <laughs> that look like because my that's my immediate question as someone who's involved in this world like as somebody who wants to understand these things um how do how do canadians meaningfully engage how can i say sorry brent like i think that one of the biggest ways of like engaging is voting in solidarity so like looking like d engaging with our democracy it should not just be around like elections, right? Like we should be participating and holding our leaders accountable on an ongoing basis. But a really easy way to walk the talk in a way that our leaders aren't is to show up to the polls and vote for parties that are prioritizing. Um, communities that we, we as young people are starting to understand have been like significantly and systemically oppressed in like 
the most garbage way possible. Like, if, if it was you or yours going through that, you would fucking lose your shit over it. You would not be okay with it. But we're all right with that happening to Indigenous people because, like Brent's saying, it's, like, out of sight, out of mind. We're not seeing it. We're not mm -hmm. hearing about it. The media doesn't report on it in a consistent way. Like, so we're just, like, going about our lives pretending things are okay when they're not. And that same, like, I was saying to our team yesterday, the same devastation we all felt um, as non-Indigenous people in, the, in this country last year, um, uh, when when 215 children were covered in Kamloops, BC, like the whole country was like up in arms. Nothing's fucking changed, guys. Like nothing's changed. That that rage, that sadness, that disappointment, it is just as real today as it was then. If if anything, they've recovered more bodies. We're just not talking about it. So for me, when I talk, like think about the, these issues, when I think about what we can do, I think it's like voting and then reminding our leaders like what Brent was saying that like reconciliation is like not just one person's job it's all of the different ministers and leaders jobs so how are all of them once they're in office um holding like trying to enact the calls to action trying to enact the calls to justice trying to you know just like be solid treaty partners it's constantly over and over again holding those leaders accountable to that because Anything less than that, and I, I've written this in our content, anything less than that makes us just as bad as the colonizers that started this shit. Like, it's not a pretty thought, but it rages my bones that we're sitting here acting like we can't do something about it when we can't. We have the ability. Um, we just got to keep making noise. And then, like, I don't want to be remembered in history as a generation that was like, yes, we'll do more of the same. Like, that's not what I want for us. I think we're better than that. Um, so yeah, that's my mini rant, but I'll hand it back to you guys. Amazing rant, yes, both <laughs> Sam. Um, no, and that, I think that's how how do we how do we how do we do this? Like, you know, no matter who's in government, if, again, whoever wins next year or the, next year, whoever wins in, the, in June <laughs> for two weeks, um, again, I I really want to impress upon people that like politics is an ongoing, everyday kind of thing. It, it, it every four years doesn't actually matter. It's the it's the stuff in between the elections that's important. So, how do we build a new social movement? How do we build a new movement? Or how do we build connection amongst people that's rooted in anti colonialism, anti racism, um, feminism? You know, look at the stuff that's happening down in the states. Um, I think like there's a lot of crazy things happening around the world that liberalism is never just an always we it's it's not an endless march up it, there, there are deep valleys that we're going to fall into and so how do we prepare young people to when we fall into these deep valleys we are able to just march our way back up because that's that i, I can there's a valley coming basically in canada we've avoided it i think i think there are different you, you can see pockets of things starting to spring up that are very worrying so convoys and other other crap um how how are we going to respond to this when when things happen, because I think at the end of the day, we've seen that the governments are just going to bow and cow to this, or they're just going to bow and cow to to not that they're toothless and afraid. So, how are we going to make them um, afraid again? And I think before Sam, we were talking about you know even the environmental movement, right? We had we had the, everyone marching through the streets, and then Justin popped in, and was like, ah, environment. I'm like, no, it's it, it, the people are mad at you, <laughs> right? And instantly it was co-opted where it was just like, oh, we're every yeah. everyone in fight for the environment. I'm like, like no, like. It, you have the power you you can change you have the levers mm -hmm. and, and it's it's frustrating i i want an, i want basic income i want four-day work weeks i want a new social contract that looks at gig economy i i think someone i read before i don't know if it was in one of your on canada posts but why should why do we need dual incomes to be able to afford homes like as a single person it, it our world is built for not not how it's built we need to rebuild um we need to restore I think that's the important aspect. How do we restore our relationships? That's relationships to the land, relationship to each other, relationships to our governments, relationships to where we all came from. Like we need to rebuild our relationships. How do we keep these conversations going? I that's why I love the On Canada project because I, I tune in every once in a while. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys did great. Mm -hmm. But we need more. We need we I, I always challenge every Canadian I meet, how do you implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in your daily life as you, as a person? Like how, in your in your book clubs, in your tennis clubs, in your school sports teams, at every aspect, you, you, we cannot. What's that one thing? We can't use the master's tools to dismantle the house 
right? Like, we can't rely on the federal government to dismantle colonialism. It, it's not going to happen. We have to do that. Um, it will never not be a colonial entity. That is the reality of it. It yeah. won't. It'll always be a colony. It'll always, it'll always be an ongoing relationship. There's just no, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's paradoxical to think that it could be anything else, right? It's, it's, well, it I, was at one point, right? The treaties. Go back to the treaties. Share the land 50-50. Don't come in my canoe and I won't bug your canoe. Well, we'll, we'll the two-row rompum was specifically set up so that, I'll tell a story, actually. So I, I learned this last night from one of my chief dean sayers. So if you can picture a canoe, in the water, okay? And um, when the settlers came over, we heard of their, their ships being pushed by the clouds. So if you can imagine ships being pushed by the clouds, <clears throat> big sails, big giant ships, and their ships were riding high, 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 high in the water. They had nothing in them, they were empty. They just dropped off all the slaves in America, so their ships had nothing in them. Our canoes approached them, barely going above the water full of our rights, full of our language, full of our history, full of our culture, full of everything we were as a people. And when we saw these big ships with absolutely nothing inside of them, people starving, people in need, we started giving them little things. Okay, here, you can, you have the right to live on this land. You have the right to, to engage in economic activity. You, we, Indigenous people never got rights from Canada. We gave you the rights to be where you are right now. That was through treaty. That was the original relationships that we would share this land 50-50 that any resource, you would teach us things, but we had things to teach you. And how do we get back to that? Because at the end of the day, I think if we were to go back to treaty, which are also written very poorly, um, yeah. right, written by the colonizers, but there are deep um, relationships within that, that I think if we went back to that reciprocal relationships, we all like, and that's what I mean, right? We talk about creation, the creator, Everyone's like, oh, God. I'm like, no, creation is everyone. The rocks, the, like, everything is connected. And so when you affect one, you affect the other. Um, and I think that's how do we restore our relationship on this land? Um, and that's, that's the important aspect of it. It's beautiful. <laughs> and so when the forces you're describing, it's so much of it, you're right, rests with the cultural movement. It rests with all of us as Canadians taking interest in learning and you know, creating partnerships and solidarity. Um, when you see politics and government come into it, where where is the role then for government to take that and, you know, operate as a legitimate part? So when you see these platforms and you say they only treat, you know, you as economic, what, what would you, if pen in your hand, what would you prescribe into those platforms that would take it a step further that you think they don't go to? <laughs> oh, land back. Give us land back, right? Um that's, I think there's a lot of important aspects. I, 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 my, I, I'm right now, I'm, I'm in my community. I, 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 would, I would take you all around. Um, it's a postage stamp, right? Like it's a little tiny, tiny postage stamp. And I'm meant to, to, to build housing. I'm meant to do all of these things on this tiny postage stamp. And when people, I don't think people realize how important connection to land is, connection to culture, connection to all these things. And that's, that, that's my ask. You've taken it all away. I, I, when I went to the provincial school board, that's what I said. I was like, listen, you're the inheritors of the legacy of residential school as Catholic educators. <laughs> and I was like, you inherited that. So how are, how are you going to, to support our language programs, support, support all of these things? And those are the aspects. It's like, and government can get very prescriptive in how they, they're like, mm -hmm. okay, so here's you. You need to have a teacher. You need to have this. You need to have this. Um, and so how can you just, just help us without getting, without prescribing and being very patriarchal around what, oh, you need to have this, you need to have this. Um, for example, I think they just gave a couple million dollars to Portugal, like randomly, They're like here's a couple million dollars for aid, right? But yet for us, I have to fill out reports. I have to do all these things, I have to do proposals. I have like, it's never just a nation to nation relationship. It is, it, it is a one of, I'm still a crown ward. I still have my status card that has a number on it that, it, the only difference is it's on a card and not tattooed on my arm and yeah. that and that 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 gives me access to things and that's i'm a number right so i don't know i it's very complicated and i think many people over decades have tried to solve this issue <laughs> right the, and it's the the indian problem has been something that canada has been trying to solve for generations and we're still here yeah I mean, if you're, if you're, well, I mean, we're happy to go in this direction. I know this is supposed to be an on-election kind of focus, but I'm, <laughs> so I'm happy to keep going in this direction. 
great. Like, I, I do think that it is election related, though, because when we're talking about the future of our country and we're talking about the future of our province, we have to like we can't keep putting band aids on the issues that we have to deal with. It feels. I was on a call earlier this week that was talking about okay, so like the vaccine uptake was really low with black and indigenous communities. And I'm like, yeah, duh. Like, of course it fucking was. Cause when has the government done anything for black and indigenous people? Like it hasn't, but then you're like, take the vaccine and you're expecting people to jump too. Like if you, you can't put band-aids over solutions, if you want people to trust you, be trustworthy, do better. That's a, that's a bit of a, and then I, I will, I'll push back cause I agree with you, but I'll push back on like, isn't that a loop of like, it's a chicken and the egg. It's like, well, be no. trustworthy, but we're trying. It's not the chicken and the egg. It's and they're not being trustworthy because their systems have not, uh, like, they're. It's we're seeing in the way that they're enacting things how performative it is. If you really want to show, like, I, again, I'm not black or indigenous, so like, punch me in the face if I'm speaking out of turn. Sure. Um, but like, you've got to be. You've got to like. There's a there's a cheat sheet. There's a calls to action. Fucking do that now. Ask indigenous people to take a vaccine maybe they'll be more likely to do it like maybe they'll be less like more willing to trust you when you walk like the talk on top of each other like implement the calls to action and then there's that more of that institutional trust brent do you feel like that like if if and when government has fulfilled on something that it's promised have you seen that it builds some trust so the thing with like so vaccines are were difficult for sure so as as the chief right you, we 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 had that we were one of the first people to get the vaccine and to try and there was so much fear because again exactly what sam said around yeah you know in the past the government has done this and done that but at the same time it's a it, it's actually a, it was funny we, we it was a treaty right right the government promised to provide medicine in that that was one of the, that was one of the promises right so that so technically they're, they're fulfilling a treaty right by putting us first but because of the poor relationship, many of my people were afraid. And so what my health staff had to do was, 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 was work and work and work to build that trust to be like, no, like I wouldn't take something that, that you know, I wouldn't take something, I'm going to take something that I wouldn't put Right. So, yeah. but the thing that is super frustrating is when as a leader in this whole pandemic, you know, we do, I, I sit there and I go, this is what I, I, I sit in front of my community. And then, you know, with, 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 within a flick of a news cycle, all of a sudden it's like completely changed. Right. And then we're sitting there and everyone's like, well, you said this. And I go, well, yeah, but like, it's still true. <laughs> like, it's still like, you know, and that's the tough part is when government and, and it's they flip back and forth behind behind us almost oh wait what about other treaty rights obligations the government should be following oh my gosh um well they technically are following a lot of the treaty rights but not properly implementing them such as resource revenue sharing which is what my one of my treaty states right so they promise to give medicine they promise to give education they promise to give um training development skills all of these things um, and something else that's really cool. Um, so when they made the treaties, they made them all and they promised all this gold. Well, indigenous people don't have banks or pockets. And so what they did is all the money that was promised to indigenous people from the treaties, they put in the Bank of England. And so when they- There's a bank. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. Oh God, go on. This, this is the thing. And so they put it all in the Bank of England. Hey, wait, 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 it gets better. They put it all in the Bank of England and then when they repatriated the constitution, they brought it all back and then they used it to build the country. So the roads, the 500 series highways, the canals was all used using indigenous treaty money. Um, the Department of Indian Affairs isn't run by taxes. It's, it's, it's run by the treaty money, which is why I love when it, people are like, oh my God, the indigenous people, they don't pay taxes. We keep paying for it. And I was like, no, that's actually treaty money. That's are you fucking this. joking? Yeah, 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 no, it's that. <laughs> Woo <-hoo>. Surprise. <laughs> it just gets worse no, and It gets worse. worse, it gets worse. <laughs> But that's, that's the thing, right? Again, oh there God. has to be truth before reconciliation. And this country doesn't even know truth. And I keep saying that. We need truth. Um, and yeah, anyway. But what is happening in this election? Who knows? Bring <laughs> <laughs> back, because that links back perfectly. We've seen, you know, two progressive platforms in front of us today that we've gone through. And I'm pretty sure both promised increased mandatory Indigenous education in schools. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, teaching with residential schools. Right. 
that that you know that hope and that uh, the truth coming first is that is that promising? Do you think that there's merit to that? So, all I can only speak from my own experiences and my interaction with local local peoples, and that's where I'm hopeful, like the tiniest of hope, right? So, um, at the Cath- I'm, I'm a trustee at the Catholic School Board, um, you know, Catholicism, um, but they're trying, right? Like p- everyday Canadians. Mm are trying um i just need the governments to try with them or maybe this this is this is this is what it's going to take is is we are standing at the start of 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 learning and it's going to take 20 30 years and a lot of pain to get us to where everybody understands because i can go and talk to people in elliott lake which is 45 minutes away from me right about what's happened here and they don't even know about my own community yeah we're just down the road. Um, I saw some people, oh, yeah, that's what it is. I think um, something else I think about is like, to go back to um, Anushka, what you were saying around like, what comes first, like the chicken or the egg thing. I think um, the fact that uh, just this week, I was in conversations about like, um, the convoy, like, like it wasn't that long ago um and how there's still like people going like oh we have to figure out how to heal a nation as if that's like this pandemic is where the division or the pain started and i keep i feel like the fact that that's like an ongoing rhetoric within progressive leaders like because i'm like i'm not out here taking meetings with conservatives like uh, like the meetings i'm in are like fairly progressive people trying to do good things in the world yeah. And they're the the stem of the like the, they're like, yeah, there's such a division, there's a division, there's a division. And they're talking about this fucking convoy and this pandemic. Um and it boggles my mind that that's the focus when the real hurt, the real harm that's been done um to black and indigenous folk in this country historically and ongoingly hasn't been like addressed at all. And if you don't address that I don't understand how we're supposed to move forward and how you're supposed to expect like it just it feels like we're doing things in the wrong order um and that really is frustrating to me because until these until our leaders start centering the like the concerns of black and and indigenous folk and other marginalized communities in their decision making um I don't see us coming out of this like weird political game that we're like all playing in where like it's half-assed policies where they're like half solutions so you've kind of made a decision but not fully made a decision I don't know I feel like I'm very invested in our country and it being like you know prosperous and 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 successful but I feel like we focus on the wrong things we don't solve the issues that need to be solved we're so focused on things like GDP which are important money important Very but like nice. what's the like what's our happiness index score like is like why aren't we like measuring how well the people in our country are doing why aren't our basic needs being met like why do I have to sit here planning one day to get married not because like I'm like uh like I, I, I want to be in love like that's important but in my head it's like one day I'll afford a house with this dual income why is that the reason that I want a house like so it, it'll take 22 years for the average young person to to save up for a down payment on a home I'm fucked bro like I I don't have 22 years I'm already 32 that'll be I, don't, I can't count 50 something. I don't even know. Right. Like I'm supposed to already have a nest egg and be fine by that. Like I, I, there are serious gener- intergenerational issues, which we haven't even begun to address either that, that need like who is going to take out the housing market when half of like a certain percentage of Canadians, that's their whole wealth is tied up into that. But yet because of that wealth, I can never get into the housing market. I'll never be able to afford to get in. And then what? Like people are not starting families, like you said. So not the people are are stopping very clear milestones that we all should have had, or we all like maybe that maybe that's it. Maybe that that Canadian dream needs to to die, and some we need a new Canadian dream. But I still deserve equitable housing. I mean, I'm sitting in a house now on reserve, which is really nice, but I'll never be able to leave because I can't afford a down payment on reserve, right? Um, 
So what, <laughs> what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this when everyone's working in a gig economy, when there's no pensions? Like, does anybody actually expect to have pensions when it, we all come to retire? Like, no, no. I'm hoping for a swift death. That's my point. <laughs> <laughs> Just... The monkey pop. <laughs> Back to the monkey box. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, it's just, it's so funny. Um, it's That's my retirement plan, though. Right. Uh, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to things. I guess whether this election, however this election goes, I think that this, this is a clear signal that um, we require a reinvention of certain parties. We need to re come back to some social contract of some sorts that, like. I should be able to work, you know, 30 hours a week and have an equitable life. We shouldn't have to depend yeah. on the people running our grocery stores or serving food or the, the, the most vulnerable to make absolutely nothing so that I can have, you know, a cheap grilled cheese. Like we need to fix equitability in our society. And I think, you know, whether it's an indigenous issue, whether it, it doesn't matter, right? You, you fix the most vulnerable and you fix everybody. Yeah, literally. Literally. But for some reason, um, we we look at people like it's almost, it's, it's your fault. Pull yourself up from your bootstraps like right? can't, without can't, ignoring the yeah. systemic barriers that are in place that are causing this to happen. Um, that are designed to make it happen like this. Mm -hmm. Like this is what it was meant to do. And if we want it to be different, we're going to have to keep demanding it. And it's annoying because it's a lot of fucking work. We have other things to do. Um, but... At the same time, the alternative is just letting the status quo continue. And that's even more scarier. Like, I really have gotten back, back into horror movies because they're like, not as scary as the world we're presently living in. And it's kind of nice to take a break. Um, and I feel like we have to be able to be willing to switch that up. We've, And I believe in young people. Like, I feel like I, the more of us who are who are sitting there and going like, this doesn't make sense. Like keep saying that, but also engage in our system because we need to make sure our votes count. We need to make sure that we're being heard, but keep questioning the system as a whole, because at some point we'll be able to do something with that, but we can't just like be like satisfied with like the state of affairs. The state of affairs suck. Um, you can also decline your ballot. Okay. Yeah, that's recorded. I think, right? Yes, you can just. Yeah, you could, but also, like, at least you're voting. As people are voting, if you don't want to vote for anybody. Uh, sure. At least go out and engage in the process. Or, <laughs> or just find a way to vote for it out. These are my ending pleas on this. Yeah, um, Sam. I think you said you so you said exactly what I was kind of going through my mind, which is like I think as young people and people who are very passionate about these issues, we get really excited at the prospect of like massive institutional change, like completely overhauling, imagining something from a new, getting things brand new, like getting this, you know, newness is great, but big systems and institutions, you can't just flip them like a tablecloth. And that's the reality, right? And like, mm -hmm. and as nice as it sounds, actual transition between governments historically no matter where you are is rough and painful and often ends up in more oppression so it's and like i'm someone who wants to change the world for the better and i will always want to be putting my whole heart into doing that but i'm not under the illusion that i can flip a whole system like i don't think that that's good i think that what that leads to is a deep deep frustration in the system that then results in a lack of participation in it because I see a lot of young voters not participating in voting, not wanting to participate in the system because they are fed up with it. And they have every right to be. The system is, has failed us. We've inherited a really, really crappy. Mm -hmm. I get that. But you cannot take that reality and then just say, well, you know, screw the system. I, I'm, I, I, I can't do this. I, I just want all of it to change. And then use that as some sort of a justification to opt out. Because then the voting blocks that do do that are the Doug Ford voting blocks. They're the Ontario Party voting blocks. They're the new blue voting blocks. Because they're the ones who feel enfranchised by the system. And they are acting like they are deserving of it. And so if we're all deserving of it, we've all got to engage with it, right? Like, and that's my, and that's totally my- Totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So, I think my thing is that like, we have to, I, I think it's like pragmatic, but like, understanding what the goal is like you can't be satisfied with like incremental change because you should want 
dramatic drastic change like that should be the goal is transformational change right but understanding that that's not likely and engaging in the system to get it to where it needs to go but if we give up hope on that transformational change then we accept the current state and that's what i'm not willing to do i'm not willing to just sit here and be like all right cool i'll play the long game and then one day i'll pass it off to my child who will keep fighting the good fight and then one day that kid will pass it on to the next kid and then the plant i mean provided we all live that long Um, as a species but like that doesn't seem fun to me I want to dream that this is something that our generation does takes on and is able to address and sure maybe we don't but I'm not gonna stop fighting for it gotta keep Um, trying gotta keep trying yeah we gotta keep trying we gotta know that there is better um I think there's something interesting about how like that sort of we can imagine like these the end of the world like what an apocalyptic world looks like but we can't look at what it looks like without capitalism or without like like there's no we don't think or talk about that as much or like see movies about that but there's like every next every weekend there's a new movie on like post-apocalyptic universe or new tv show you know well that also makes um, for more flashy cinematography i'll be honest oh yeah no like i'm not mad i deeply enjoy that and i have pre- prepped <laughs> mentally for the end of the world i'm hitting up a walmart first and foremost um yeah. oh my god yeah. well the funny thing is indigenous people have already lived through an apocalypse Oh god, that's so fucking depressing. <laughs> right, all our whole world was changed and destroyed. So you know, welcome, welcome to the club. Um, so I sorry. guess what I the my my final message because I'm gonna do one too is I, I I want people to be visionary, dream big. I we need visionary leadership. We like the climate crisis. All of these things are leading to a hopelessness crisis amongst our youth, and we need. Uh, and that's my one thing. I want party leaders to be visionary leaders. G- give us like if it doesn't, if it, even if it's like that's impossible. Like, we need to dream big in order to be able to overcome these obstacles. Our people, people need to wake up in the morning and go, "I'm excited because this is happening." Um, I, I need that visionary leadership. And so, you know, something always laughs is if you you don't hear it yourself, then it's your time to stand up and provide that. So that's my challenge to all of our young leaders: is it's time for you to get visionary and, and take your space up. Woo. Thank you, D. It's not me, though. <laughs> it is you. Twenty twenty six. It is. What? No. <laughs> I'm trying to convince Brent to run for supreme leader of the universe. I'm not really sure how that works. <laughs> yeah, watch out. Coming to a political party near you. <laughs> love it. I love it. Um. Well, yeah. I guess we're we're about to hit seven. Um, Anusha, do you have uh, any final thoughts? Um. I, we always are like, this is going to be 30 minutes, and then we get into the conversation, and it never ends. Um, it's not a bad thing, though. Brent, thank you so much. Um, any final thoughts, Anushka? No, he said it all. That's it. He has that. He has that superpower. Um, thanks, everyone, for engaging. Advanced polls are open until the 28th? 10 days. So I think that would be the 28th? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's right, 28th. Go and vote. Um, uh, and um, vote in solidarity for the communities that you care about. Vote for, vote for progress and change. And don't like yes, the polls and everything suck, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't engage in the system. Um, if we can, even if he wins, but it's a minority government, that's more than what we fucking have right now. It's like better than what we have right now. So, um, go vote. Yeah. And then if you don't hit, go to the advanced polls, June 2nd. Um, I will be crying all day June 2nd. Uh, so send me a text, friends. Um, I'll see instead you guys. Of, instead of crying, you can get involved in a campaign and help pull out people to go vote. No, man. I'm, I'm doing my part. The, the, it's this live. I've done my part now. <laughs> live all day and then cry. <laughs> an Uber live. Do an Uber live, Sam. Put your yeah. phone in and interview voters as you're driving them to the polling station. Yeah, yeah that sounds... Um, like a lot of work uh and i will not be in that state but yeah um no i'd rather just cry <laughs> i'm just gonna drink some wine on gin second and take myself for a massage um we'll see they will be fine we'll all be fine it's all gonna be fine or it really is it really is the it, it's, it, it is it is. It actually is. We're all just okay. going to make good work. We're all like, I, I feel so bad. I see Sam and she's like spinning sometimes with like this awful, awful dread. And it's like, we're all doing the good work. We're all here. We show up. Yes, we do these lives. Yes, Brent goes and runs his shit. Yes, <laughs> right? We're all doing our part. And, and like the time's ticking on and the pendulum's going to swing and we're going to build our.
excitement and it's going to be good. We are going to inherit the, like, the power to do things that we want to do. So I agree. Be- I agree. I'm normally a glass, like half full person. I'm just um, a hot mess express right now. So um, okay, friends, going to wrap it up here. 